10 minutes on Julian Barnes's A History of the World in 10 and a half chapters. The title is clearly provocative. Historians never advertise the numbers of their chapters because that would be to emphasise form over content, which historians generally don't want to do. But then, in English, the words history and story were barely distinct until a gap opened up in Shakespeare's time and then grew and grew until postmodern historiography began to narrow it again. But I say this, that is precisely the kind of broad historical statement which this novel, if we can call it that, distrusts. It tells stories rather than stating abstractions. The narrator of the book's parenthesis says in a resounding summation of the postmodern historiographical attitude, We all know objective truth is not obtainable, that when some event occurs we shall have a multiplicity of subjective truths which we assess and then fabulate into history, into some god-eyed version of what really happened. This god-eyed version is a fake Certainly, God in this book is largely a fake. To the woodworm on Noah's Ark in chapter 1, he appears only through Noah's mediation as very unlike the God represented by the Old Testament. God is something you can choose to believe in or not in heaven as dreamt in chapter 10. He stands and falls alongside the kind of history which elevates and isolates the fact that in 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So the book teases history and the reader. This anti-history offers no continuity in time or space except between chapters 5 and 6 which involves a transition from a painting by Jericot to a young woman looking at that picture. Significantly, a transition which it takes the form of art, not historical cause and effect. Between chapters, we as readers are moved as on a rendition flight. We know not whither, and are tipped out at the beginning of a new chapter where we have to look round and orientate ourselves as best we can. There are patterns, though, which hold the book more or less together, The woodworm, which is our first narrator, worms its way through several of the other chapters, and when he doesn't appear, then an ark does, or a ship, or sometimes the sea. The clean and the unclean, racism and survival are persistent tropes. But this is the kind of patterning one expects in a novel, not a history. The transcendent, persistent factors, such as they are, are implicit rather than explicit and are encountered through aesthetic response to the book rather than as argument. Most of the chapters are set, though, in a defined time and place and make reference to what we know as historical events. The earthquake which destroyed the village of Argory on Mount Ararat or the 1960s moon landings but they nearly always deviate from these. Barnes could have written about the Achille Lauro, the Italian cruise ship which was hijacked by Palestinian terrorists in 1985 off Egypt. But instead he writes about the Santa Euphemia, which picks up its Palestinian terrorists in Rhodes and then the boat is on its way to Crete. The actor Charlie is making a film in the Amazon which resembles the British 1986 film The Mission but clearly isn't it because Charlie isn't Robert De Niro nor Jeremy Irons. There is one historian in this book, Franklin Hughes, the guest lecturer on the Santa Euphemia. Of all the book's characters, I think that the narrative's tone is most detached from and sceptical of Hughes. Particularly at the beginning of the chapter, he is represented as sleazy, shallow and self-dramatising. And of course he owes it his existence, being fictional, to a novelist. The chapter about the wreck of the Medusa contemplates how Jericho turns, quote, catastrophe into art. At one level, it tries to undo Jericho's process of fictionalising by showing how his painting deviates from what are known as the facts of the wreck of the Medusa. But on another level, it performs its own version of turning catastrophe into art, in this case, verbal art. 
And yet, in the chapter about the terrorist hijacking, competing accounts of history are worth arguing about and killing for. Franklin Hughes considers risking the execution of his girlfriend because of his belief that the version of Middle Eastern history, as stated by one of the terrorists, is wrong. And the narrative, too, seems to think that it is wrong. The test case which is often used by people who wish to argue against postmodern historiography is the Nazi Holocaust. If there is no historical truth, then the door is open to Holocaust denial. Barnes himself uses this case. In the third of his three simple stories in chapter 7, he concerns the ship of Jewish refugees turned back from America in 1939, and this is as close as this book comes to offering history rather than a story. Here there is no struggle for the reader with orientation. The chapter begins quite precisely. At 8pm on Saturday, 13th of May 1939, the liner St. Louis left its home port of Hamburg. The author's note at the end of the book states, The third part of chapter 7 takes its facts from The Voyage of the Damned by Gordon Thomas and Max Morgan Witz. Hodder, 1974. This story is told without self-consciousness or distancing devices. It ends with a measured historical statement. Estimates of how many survived vary. It will not, in the absence of historical evidence, guess or make it up. The narrator of the parenthesis says that, quote, we must still believe that objective truth is obtainable or we must believe it is 99% obtainable. Or if we can't believe this, we must believe that 43% objective truth is better than 41%. We must do so, because if we don't, we fall into beguiling relativity. Overall, the novel's ten and a half chapters suggest that certain factors are constant in human history. The classification of humans by type, and the discrimination of some types against others. The fact that, as the lead terrorist says in chapter 2, the world is not a cheerful place. I would have thought your researches into ancient history would have taught you that. Humans from these ancient civilizations onwards have had a hunger for God or gods and, connectedly, for stories. When Franklin Hughes begins to give his story of Palestine under the most stressful possible circumstances, his audience begins to relax. They were being told a story, and they were offering themselves to the storyteller in the manner of audiences down the ages. This book offers itself, too, to us as a collection of stories to entertain us, but also to instruct us, not just in toleration of many kinds of people, as well as in scepticism of their historical and religious narratives, but also to instruct us in certain historical facts. Readers are meant to come away knowing more about the Medusa, Mount Ararat and the St. Louis than they did before, and also wanting to find out still more. To distinguish to what extent any of the chapters are in fact based on historical truth. In this sense, this book is an anti-history in the service of history. This is the paradox, perhaps, of the woodworm, an animal which cannot speak or write but which asks us to trust its account of a mythical event, and which rightly challenges us. You aren't too good with the truth either, your species. You forget things, or pretend to. Thank you.